uh, what your opinions are on the government's involvement with the automotive industry um, a couple years ago during the economic crisis? Well, I, th I think there, were no, there was no other alternative. I don't like the way it came out, but I do believe that going through a bankruptcy was absolutely the only way you could possibly save either one of the companies. Uh, it's not clear that you will be saved in any way, but at least they wouldn't have had a chance uh, they were able to get rid of, dramatically reduce their labor, get rid of a lot of plants, a lot of dealers, a lot of other stuff. As a matter of fact, if you read the Wall Street Journal today, the government, you and I, are picking up $784 million in, in what the government is going to remediate some of the closed plants that were, you know, uh, went away with bankruptcy on environmental issues. So, the government is very, very involved. Uh, as you know, the GM is starting a little IPO, partial IPO. Uh, I think that it's going to probably be a disappointment only because if you look at the price and the calculation that I saw and I assume is right, is you would have to be somewhere significantly north of $60 to ever get the, money, get the government money back. And they're now talking about hoping to go out at $20. $20. Here. So I think it's a, uh, I think they'll be involved for a long time. And it's not just the government. Of course, as you know, the unions own a substantial portion of both companies. And that's even worse because when you're bargaining with somebody that owns, uh, I think the price was the case over half of it, uh, it makes bargaining just a little bit tough. Does that answer your question? How, how do you feel about the government buying shares of companies? Is it, is it, is it oh, I think it's, it's absolutely a bad thing. You know, I'm a real strong believer in private enterprise. Uh, I would not have felt bad if the government had even stepped in. They did step in, and, and, and it gives the companies a chance. But I sure would like to see them get out as soon as they can, and I would like them not to do it, you know, not to continue. That should, that should not be a precedent in any way, shape, or form. I was not in favor of it. I think that, that you know, this, this kind of has done what it's done because of the private enterprise. And we do not want to move to government ownership of, of you know, anything more than we have to. Our government's too big uh, right now. Uh, Let me come back to your first question. Remind me what it was. I'm sorry, I forgot. This, um, uh, how do you dealt with that criticism? Oh, okay, uh, we have to we have to just take it. I mean, uh, if constructive criticism is one thing, and you all should should really seek that. Uh, and but you know, if you're going to have a high profile, you're going to get a lot of press, and uh, a lot of the press is going to be fantastic, and a lot of it's going to be bad. Uh, if you get criticism within the organization. Uh, it, 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 in my case, it was it was the fringes. Uh, I had a very good relationship, partially because I did what we were talking about with respect to strategy. We had a plan that everybody was bought into, and we saw terrific results, and we saw we saw very good financial rewards out of it. And you know, you're always going to have this problem employee, and you're going to always have a press that's out there that's trying to dig something up, but you just have to. Constructive criticism is another thing. Just went through with a company I was involved with where you actually brought a company in to assess the top management in a very, very good process. And it was not all good by, by long shots. But at the end of that, every single one of those executives said, it was a great process. I should have done it before because it was constructive criticism not just pure criticism. What was the, uh, the competition like between both the, uh, the big three domestic auto manufacturers and also the international auto manufacturing? Oh, it's an extremely, uh, extremely competitive business. But, uh, uh, I, at, at the top of the organization, because of 
industry organizations and things you're you know you're with the CEOs and the top people of the other companies all the time. And you're, uh, you can be reasonably good friends, etc. But when it comes to competition, you're out to take every customer they've got, and they're trying to do the same thing. And you're out to have the best product. And you're trying to make sure that you beat them in every aspect. So it, it's what it's what private enterprise is all about. That's why we want to continue to have private enterprise and not have the government involved. Because they, that is not a competitive environment in that case. So, so it, it's, going to get, it's going to get a lot tougher. Uh, I don't believe anybody in this room 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when Korean cars were pretty much junk. Highest quality car sold in America last year was a Nissan. That just shows you the competition that's building outside of the United States and why if you want to compete, you've got to be better than that. So every morning when you get up, you've got to recognize that if you're not moving that toward your, your mission, toward your key success factors, you're going to be ultimately extinct. And I told you that I wasn't sure that some of the companies in the US were going to make it. Oh, it's going to be very, very tough. What's my dream? Yeah. Creativity and, uh, and 
so forth, there's a tremendous future out there. And again, that you better really have passion and really be focused. You got that's the top here. Top way to go, but unbelievably rewarding, both financially as well as you know, every other way. I was reading an old Time magazine article that talked about you and the fellow heads of Ford and GM back uh, 10 years ago or whatnot. And you were talking about being competitive while still maintaining a good friendship with the other two heads. And it, it referenced that the three of you would occasionally meet. What were those meetings like? What sort of things would you discuss? Well, we had them in turn. <laughs> 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 I was the guy. We had them in turn. Uh, every single time we got together. And, and that's because of obviously I had to cut them off and start. Uh, the head of GM at the time was, was a guy that I worked with at GM for years. Uh, worked with and for the fact. And uh, the, the Ford guy uh, had been a long time. We had to be together. Well, you went to all major auto shows in the world, so you were always there together. You, Detroit is a fairly small place, and you're all doing civic things and so forth uh, because you're the biggest employers in the art and you're getting here together. So naturally, but it, it was it was a it was friendly, but it was just as competitive the next morning. It was, and if we were doing anything where we talked about business in any way, or we were by ourselves, curious or by ourselves, we always had. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for graduating students um, first time going through industrial design and engineering? Um, what kind of aspects or guidelines do you go about when you're hiring? Would it be networking um, skill sets or just a pure drive to them? Okay, uh, networking is obviously good. I think things have changed quite a lot since, since I graduated, uh, obviously. Uh, as I said, I was very fortunate. I don't think anyone. One interview and they, they fortunately hired me in the United States. Until I went to Chrysler, that was the only interview I think I ever had in my life. Uh, I think it's tough. I can tell you one thing. Sending resumes to a company is completely blind. It's pretty much a waste. You gotta figure, you know, you've got to figure out job fair somewhere you can have some personal contact. Uh, the best thing you possibly do would be an internship. And two or three internships, you know, even, even if it pay you or hard to pay you. Uh, so many people can hire that way because you get in and people over the course of three months figure out, if, you know, you think somebody they'd like to work with. So I'd say, I'd say intern number one. Number two would be network. Some way, you know, sending your, your uh, resume to some, some friends or some friends of your family or whatever that, you know, you can. And, uh, and if they're still doing campus interviews, that's it. Personal context, what it takes. So I'll go back and say that intern number one, personal interviews number to network. And I wouldn't be overly, I would send them out 300 resumes. I used to get, I don't even know how many because I never saw most of them, but lots every single day. Even if it was somebody I knew, but not well enough to really recommend them, I would send it to the first note people and say, you know, I, I do know this person's parents, but you know, I don't want to. I don't want to distort what you're trying to do. In other words, if he if, if he wouldn't qualify in the in the regular process, I don't want to force people to hire me. But then it's my fault, and we're not getting the best people we can 